Hello and welcome to the Irish History Podcast. My name is Finn Dwyer. Now over the next two weeks, I'll be pretty busy writing an upcoming series. So I've selected two very different episodes from the back catalogue that I thought would be interesting for you to dive back into. Now this week, I've selected an episode from 2019. It was released towards the end of the Great Famine series, which had been running for about two and a half years at this point, and it asks, was the Great Hunger a genocide? This is one of the most listened to episodes of the show, and without doubt it generated the most feedback. It is a tricky topic. The Great Hunger is a particularly emotive subject for Irish people the world over, and rightly so. And in this podcast, I ask if the term genocide adequately explains how one million people died and millions more emigrated to escape the horrors of the Great Famine at home. Before I jump into this, I have two quick announcements. Firstly, I have a live show in conjunction with the podcast Snugcast in Phil Grimes Pub in Waterford this Saturday, that's August 20th. The show is called History from the High Stool, and we're going to be talking about the life of Michael Collins on the 100th anniversary of his death. Tickets are just €5 Euros and you get a free pint at the door, so it's a win-win. You can find links for that in the show notes below. Now secondly, I've mentioned the supporters' trip to Conway Castle in Wales over the last few episodes. After consulting with supporters, it seems that the weekend of October the 8th is best suited to the most amount of people. Now you can still come if you're interested, just let me know. It would be great to have you on board for what's going to be a great trip to a pretty spectacular medieval castle. If you aren't a supporter yet, you can still sign up and join me on that trip to Conway at patreon.com forward slash Irish podcast. That's patreon.com forward slash Irish podcast. I also have links to that in the show notes below. Now, let's get into the show. Trying to make sense of the Great Irish Famine is difficult. The impact is often hard to get your head around. The Irish population fell by 25% between deaths and emigration in just six years. But when we dig down to a community level, the true devastation and its legacy is even more far-reaching. Not only was the population decimated, but the survivors found themselves living in ruins. In many parts of the West in particular, evictions and the chaos of five years of starvation left survivors in a countryside more similar to a war zone than the Ireland they had known before the famine. The full extent of the misery people lived in is hard to convey. In 1856, around five years after the worst of the famine had subsided, Friedrich Engels, one of the co-authors of the Communist Manifesto, visited Ireland and wrote to Karl Marx describing what he encountered. Throughout the West, but especially in the region around Galway, the country is covered with these ruins of peasants' cottages, most of which have been abandoned only since 1846. I never understood before that famine could be such a tangible reality. Whole villages are deserted, and there amongst them lie the splendid parks of the lesser landlords, who are almost the only people who live there now. Famine, emigration and clearances together have accomplished this. Here, there are not even cattle to be seen in the fields. The land is an utter desert, which nobody wants. Angles was not the only person to comment on the devastated landscape. Previous to his visit, another person from the other end of the political spectrum, Harriet Martineau, had travelled extensively through the west of Ireland in 1852 as the Great Hunger finally released its grip on society. Writing for the London Daily News, Martineau has left us with a searing record of the devastation she found around the town of Belmullet in the far northwest of Ireland. Positioned between the Mullet Peninsula and mainland County Mayo, Belmullet, in Martineau's words, had been the headquarters of the famine. However, when she arrived in 1852, the town had somewhat stabilised, but the surrounding region revealed a very different story. In the following passage, Martineau starts with a brief description of Belmullet before describing conditions in Binghamstown, a village on the Mullet Peninsula. In Belmullet there is an air of some pretension and some look of comfort, but the outskirts are miserable enough. All this is forgotten, however, on approach in Binghamstown, the most shocking wreck that we have seen, except perhaps one other village in another part of Nueo. We found more inhabitants remaining than we had expected, and they did not look personally miserable at all. But the lines of ruin where there was once a street, the weeds and filth about the deserted hearthstones, or what seemed almost worse, 
the crops of potatoes and cabbages grown on the floors where dead neighbours lived so lately made our very hearts sick. The Catholic chapel is not considered at all in a ruinous state in comparison with other places, yet its windows are half boarded up, its walls are mouldy and half the cross on its roof is gone. The large white house near was the seat of a gentleman of one of the ancient families of Ireland. After a long struggle with embarrassments, he was too weak to bear the stress of the famine year. He let his house for a workhouse and was thankful to be made its master. In those ancestral rooms he ruled as master, not of his own house, but of the workhouse. He soon died. One of his sons is, we are told, there now as a pauper. His widow and daughters live in an ordinary labourer's cottage near. While Martineau actually seems to have expected worse, the population of Binghamstown had been truly shattered during the years of famine in Ireland, leaving the surviving community with little or no future. Back in 1841, it was a relatively new settlement, home to 436 people, and the later 19th century seemed full of opportunity. Binghamstown, strung out along a road running north-south along the Mullet Peninsula, comprised of 82 houses. The brainchild of the Bingham family, the local landlords, it was designed to facilitate trade in the surrounding region, and by the 1830s it was enjoying modest success, shipping grain and potatoes down the west coast to Westport, while a fair was held in the town once a month. The Great Hunger utterly destroyed this community. When Harriet Martineau arrived, the population was nearly halved, with less than 250 people remaining on what must have been a lonely road. The number of actual houses had been nearly halved as well to 43. The rest were reduced to piles of rubble after their former inhabitants had died, been evicted or emigrated. The future of Binghamstown was bleak and it was continuously undermined with each passing decade. The fair, the lifeblood of any 19th century town, could no longer be sustained as a fatal spiral of emigration took hold. By 1861 the population had fallen to 213 people. Ten years later, in 1871, its very existence was in doubt as only 154 people remained. Binghamstown has just about survived and today its population stands at just over 100 people, a quarter of what it had been in the early 19th century. This story of annihilation is not unique. The Great Hunger was a point of no return for hundreds, indeed thousands of Irish communities. Some completely disappeared, others struggled on, their future deeply uncertain. This should come as no surprise though when we think about what happened. In the six years between 1845 and 1851, around one million Irish people perished. It's estimated there were around 400,000 averted births, nearly an entire generation that could have sustained these communities into the future, never born. This was compounded by the tens of thousands of evictions. Further to this, the emigration that devastated Binghamstown was reflected of a much wider process, hollowing out Irish society from the inside. Desperate to escape, around one million famine refugees fled the Great Hunger, most receiving sanctuary in the USA. This, however, was just the beginning of a process that continued for decades. By 1900, it is estimated that two in five people born in Ireland, were living outside the island. These statistics are hard to fathom. It leaves us somewhat bewildered as we look back and try and understand how this came to pass. Ireland was, after all, part of the wealthiest and most powerful country in the world at the time, the United Kingdom. Not only did the government fail to intervene effectively, but it didn't even stop and actually facilitated the continued export of food from the island while millions were starving. Emotional language has inevitably been employed to describe these events. It's hardly surprising, indeed it's fitting, it's an emotional topic. The terms the bad life or great hunger, which carry far greater meaning in their original Irish on Drochel or on Gorthamur, are the ones most commonly used to encapsulate what happened. However, increasingly there have been calls to use the term genocide, something which has caused major controversy both in Ireland and across the world. Over the rest of this show I'm going to look at whether we should use this term to describe what happened in Ireland in the 1840s. First though context is important and we need to see where and when the idea the Great Hunger was a genocide emerged. (laughs) 
As early as the 1860s, the Irish nationalist John Mitchell argued what happened in Ireland could not really be considered just a famine when he wrote, I have called it an artificial famine. That is to say, it was a famine which desolated a rich and fertile island that produced every year abundance and superabundance to sustain all her people and many more. The English indeed call that famine a dispensation of providence and ascribe it entirely to the blight of the potatoes. But potatoes failed in like manner all over Europe and yet there was no famine save in Ireland. The British account of the matter then is first a fraud, second a blasphemy. However, it was only in the aftermath of the Holocaust and the Second World War that the word genocide emerged, but it didn't take long before people began drawing parallels between the Great Hunger and those events. In 1962, the English historian A.J.P. Taylor, writing in the New Statesman, claimed, All Ireland was a Belsen, a reference to the concentration camp Bergen-Belsen. Such direct comparisons are very rare, and Taylor, who was no expert on the Great Hunger, received widespread criticism at the time. In the following decades, comparisons and analogies continued, but those were largely made in passing. Few stood up to scrutiny. For example, the well-known revisionist historian Roy Foster withdrew a comment he made about, and I quote, the famine holocaust. In the wider public, the subject had its supporters, although measuring how extensive this was is difficult. It does, however, appear to have grown substantially in the last 25 years due to several factors. In the mid-1990s, a concerted campaign in the USA saw activists successfully lobby to have the Great Famine included on Holocaust education courses taught in the state of New Jersey, and then subsequently a similar course in the state of New York. While the activists argued it should be up to the students to judge the matter themselves, a ham-fisted intervention by the British ambassador in Washington created an international incident which centred around the question of whether the famine was a genocide. This arose after the governor of New York, George Pataki, signed a bill which mandated the Great Famine to be added to a course that taught patriotism, citizenship and human rights issues with particular attention to the inhumanity of genocide, slavery and the Holocaust. The British ambassador accused Pataki of drawing parallels between the famine and the Holocaust, something he had actually never done, but this caused a major and very public falling out. The British government claimed the famine was a natural disaster, while activists in the US moved to an increasingly entrenched view that the famine was a genocide. The British press, using terms like Fenian propaganda, did little to help matters, while titles such as the Washington Post and the New York Times covered the story extensively. While these events helped to fuse an association between the concept of genocide and the Great Famine in the minds of some, the debate of the late 90s actually generated more heat than light, with historians having very little involvement. While the impact of the courses does not appear to have been as extensive as the headlines implied, the argument that the famine was a genocide had certainly emerged in a more coherent form than it had previously existed. Over the past 20 years, it has continued to gain popularity online, then in 2013, the Irish journalist Tim Pat Coogan entered the debate with a poorly researched book, The Famine Flot, supporting the idea that the famine was in fact a genocide. While Coogan's book was roundly criticised by historians for its very basic errors in historical details, as well as its very questionable analysis, it has proved very popular. Judging on correspondence I have received over the course of the last three years since I started this series on The Great Hunger, I suspect it is probably one of the most widely read books on the famine over the last five or six years. The belief that what happened in Ireland in the 1840s was a genocide is a view widely held by sections of the public in Ireland and to an even greater extent in Irish American communities in the US. So over the rest of this podcast I'm going to look at what exactly happened and what famine historians say on the matter. First things first though, in order to discuss this we need to first define what exactly we are talking about. So genocide is, broadly speaking, an attempt to exterminate a people or a subgroup of a population through out-and-out -out violence or just policies that lead to death. Theoretically, therefore, a famine could be a genocide. For the term to fit the Great Hunger, though, we need to look at whether the British government adopted policies which pursued a goal where their intention was to exterminate the Irish people or at least part of the Irish people. To examine this, we will start by asking what level of responsibility the British government bore to Ireland, which is a very important place to begin. 
While it might sound strange to even ask the question what responsibility the British government had over Ireland during the Great Famine, over the last few decades some have argued that they should not be held to account. So first I'm going to establish the responsibility of the two British governments during the famine before we look at what they did. In the 1840s Ireland was part of the United Kingdom ruled directly from the Houses of Parliament in Westminster, London. Theoretically, at least, Dublin was no different to a city like Manchester or Liverpool. County Mayo was no different to Yorkshire. Therefore, the governments of the late 1840s, the Conservatives of Sir Robert Peel and then the Liberals of Lord John Russell, were the ones to whom the Irish people looked to for intervention once famine set in. However, it has been argued that government, as we know it today in Europe, was still only developing in the 19th century, and famine relief was not in their purview, so expecting them to intervene is anachronistic, basically applying 21st century standards and logic to the past. This is completely untrue and contradicted by fact, though. Governments had been intervening in famines for decades in the 1840s. Indeed, the British Empire had been faced with multiple famines in India and Ireland, and they had enjoyed varying degrees of success when they intervened in famines and extreme food shortages in the 1780s and the 1820s. Secondly, it has been claimed the British government did not have the resources to effectively intervene. This is hard to reconcile with the facts as well. A decade earlier, in 1837, the British government had compensated slave owners to the tune of £20 million after slavery was abolished across the empire. That's more than double the amount they would spend on famine relief in Ireland. And indeed, the entire sum spent on famine aid, around £9.5 million, was dwarfed by the £70 million spent on the Crimean War between 1853 and 1856. Finally, some have claimed intervention in Ireland was impossible due to the poor infrastructure of the island. It is true there were some isolated communities which presented problems, but these were the exception. The logistical capability of the British Army, the Navy and the Coast Guard meant that the authorities had the ability to reach most communities by land or sea. And further to this, the Commissariat Department, the wing of the British Army responsible for supplying soldiers overseas, was in many ways designed to deal with precisely such a situation. So while it's clear the responsibility was theirs and they had the capability along with the resources, next now we need to look at precisely how they intervened so we can determine whether or not it can be called a genocide. Understanding the reaction of the British government to the Great Famine is not something that's easy to summarise. Contrary to claims often forwarded by those who argue the famine was a genocide, there was not one clear unified policy adopted in 1845 and pursued through until the early 1850s. Instead, it was formulated, adopted and adapted over years by two governments between 1845 and the early 1850s. While the various stages are covered in depth in the series, they can be summarised by four key measures. So after the failure of the potato crop in 1845, the government, realising a major crisis was unfolding, imported around £100,000 of food in secret to Ireland. They did, however, reject calls to close Irish ports to stop exports of foodstuffs from the island. The secretly imported food was going to be used to control food prices in early 1846 when it was anticipated prices would rise as extreme hunger set in. This plan was totally inadequate, however the potato harvest proved better than initially anticipated and very few perished in 1845 or early 1846. The summer of 1846 changed the situation dramatically. The potato was almost entirely destroyed by blight that year leaving the poor who had just about survived 1845 in a terrible position. Political change in England intensified the looming catastrophe when a Liberal government, headed by Lord John Russell, replaced the Conservative government of Sir Robert Peel. Although they had the tacit support of many Irish MPs, including Daniel O'Connell, the approach of the Liberals had disastrous consequences for Ireland. The Russell administration were ideologically wedded to laissez-faire policies that advocated minimal government intervention in the economy. In line with this, they scaled back imports of food, while simultaneously insisting Irish farmers and merchants should be allowed to continue to export their produce if they so wished. This free trade solution was a radical, new and untested idea at the time, 
Yet the government pushed forward, placing their faith in private merchants and the market to replace the lost potato crop. Acknowledging the poor needed money to buy this food, they did establish an extensive public works programme to provide employment. This economic experiment was utterly disastrous. The poor were too weak to work on what were often labour-intensive projects such as road building. While the sums of money being spent were considerable, around half a million pounds per month by early 1847, it was only making the situation worse. Private merchants had failed to import enough food, while exports continued unimpeded. This pushed prices through the roof, and food was way beyond the reach of many poor people. The calamitous failure of this strategy, which had led to hundreds of thousands of deaths, led to a temporary change and in the spring of 1847 the government opened soup kitchens across the island where they fed the population on extremely cheap or in many cases free food. This was effective and the numbers of deaths began to fall dramatically in the summer of 1847. However, within a few months, they returned to their policy of minimal intervention again. In September of Black 47, the government more or less proclaimed a famine to be at an end and announced they would no longer be involved in major relief efforts. From this point on, Irish poor law unions, the organisations which ran workhouses and were funded through local taxes levied in Ireland, were made responsible. This achieved the ultimate aim of the Liberal government, that the Imperial Treasury in London would no longer have to provide money for famine relief in Ireland. Unfortunately, the island was in no way able to cope, and as we have seen in the series, the conditions in the following winter of 1847 to 1848 were utterly appalling. While the story is more complex than this, these four interventions represent the major government strategies in terms of dealing with the Great Hunger. They varied from the moderately successful to the utterly disastrous. The policy of soup kitchens in early 1847 unquestionably helped. However, it was totally eclipsed by the disastrous policy of public works in 1846 and then the decision to place the burden of all famine relief on Irish taxpayers, a move which prolonged the catastrophe in some regions until 1852. The British government were essentially conducting a ruthless experiment in laissez-faire economics with the lives of the Irish people, but in this podcast we are concerned whether this constituted a genocide. For this theory to fit, we need to establish were they trying to exterminate some or all of the Irish people? Genocide, in my mind, does not explain these events or policies. The government were in fact pursuing something else entirely. The callousness involved was brutal and arguably criminal, but their goal was not genocide, as we'll see next. The Liberal government in particular, who oversaw most decisions around the famine, did not have a blueprint that dictated their every response to the catastrophe, but their decisions were shaped by what we might call guiding principles. These were, as I've said, a fervent belief in free market economics, private enterprise and limited government intervention. Although it can seem hard to believe, this worldview held that government imports of food, even in a famine situation, interfered or distorted the market, and this was only harmful in the long run. The government were never likely to deviate from these principles given it was what united them and to an extent distinguished them from a large section of the opposition. While this guided their intervention, their actions were unquestionably shaped by other ideas. Racism was crucially important. Irish Catholics in particular were considered racially inferior and this allowed politicians and civil servants to act in the callous manner they did. Many historians have commented that they would have felt compelled to adopt a more interventionist approach if the famine had struck England. However, this was not the overriding, determining factor that shaped their relief policy. And arguing that their ultimate aim was the extermination of the Irish population, or even a section of it, does not explain or help us understand what was happening in Ireland in the late 1840s. This is particularly the case when we look at the most controversial aspect of British government policy. This is the issue of exports and the fact that food continued to be shipped out of Ireland while millions starved. The fact that exports of food continued from Ireland during the Great Hunger is something that has shocked people since the 1840s. It is also the aspect of famine history distorted more than any other by inaccuracies and misinformation. There were calls for an embargo on certain exports from Ireland as early as 1845 when the famine was just unfolding. 
although this had been a pretty standard famine relief measure in previous decades, it flew in the face of the increasingly popular laissez-faire economics and even the Conservative government in 1845 rejected the calls. In hindsight, it probably wasn't needed that year. However, most historians accept that there was a very strong argument for a temporary embargo of Irish ports in the winter of 1846 to 1847, when the failure of the potato crop left around 3 million people facing starvation. Imports had fallen far short of what was needed to replace the lost crop, so restricting the export of other foods from Ireland seemed like an obvious solution. It has been debated back and forth whether this embargo would have made up the shortfall, with some historians arguing no matter what happened in that winter of 1846 to 1847, some would have died. Cormac O'Grada estimates that the 400,000 odd tonnes of grain exported to Britain would have only replaced around 14% of the potato crop lost. Christine Keneally, however, has pointed out that these figures are based on inaccurate data and that there was a lot of other food aside from grain being produced in Ireland. She argues the vast quantities of meat and dairy being shipped to England and feeding millions of people could have been utilised on the island. From the perspective of this show though, I'm not really sure how important this debate is in terms of understanding whether the famine was a genocide, given the British government were never going to close Irish ports, even if there was enough food to feed everyone. For me, this is the important issue, the fact that they were going to continue to export food no matter what. And in terms of the argument around genocide, this is the crucial aspect. We need to look at whether that policy, regardless of whether there was enough food to feed people, constituted an intent to exterminate some or all of the Irish population. In terms of answering this, the Irish historian Cormac O'Grada has highlighted a very important aspect on the issue of exports when he pointed out The export of corn belonged not to the landless or near landless masses but Ireland's half a million farmers who would certainly have resisted the lower prices an export embargo would have brought in its train. For me this is a really important point because it highlights how class background shaped attitudes among the Irish population to wider famine relief policies. And to get to the heart of this, and indeed the wider arguments around the issue of genocide, next we need to look at what or who exactly was an Irish person in the mid-19th century. The nature of food exports from Ireland has proven to be one of the most emotive and enduring aspects of the history of the Great Hunger. It is frequently portrayed as a process where the British army took food at gunpoint from the Irish people. However, as I hinted previously, the story is a bit more complex. The British Army was not raiding farms in order to export the produce to England. Instead, it was actually acting as more of a heavily armed security guard. Essentially, their role was to guarantee those who wanted to export their produce would be able to do so even in the face of major resistance from their starving neighbours. While it might seem like splitting hairs, this difference reveals the fact that in the 1840s considerable numbers of Irish people were involved and profiting from the export of their produce to British markets where they could fetch higher prices. And when I say considerable numbers, we are talking about hundreds of thousands of people, not a tiny number of people who could be written off as an exception that proved the rule. It's here where the arguments around a genocide start to unravel for me. Ultimately, the argument that the famine was a genocide only works if we forge a certain type of Irish identity where class differences between rich Irish people and poor Irish people is ignored. Because the issue of exports illustrates that these two groups had very, very different experiences of the Great Hunger. When we think of Irish people in the mid-19th century, a stereotypical image of a poor Catholic tenant farmer living in rural Ireland is often what springs to mind. However, the Irish people were a far more varied group. For example, contrary to what you might think, one in five Irish people were Protestants. But in terms of famine history, the pertinent issue is class differences. On the eve of the famine, poor law data revealed that one in four Irish farms were over 20 acres in size. This was around 220,000 holdings. Now most of the people who worked that land were directly involved in the export trade as they raised cattle or grew crops which they wanted to sell, largely in markets in Britain. Indeed, as we heard earlier, Cormac O'Grada has put the number of farmers involved in the export trade at half a million. Further to this, there were around 700 mills which ground grain into flour for export. 
they employed in the region of 30,000 additional people. These farmers and mill owners were among the fiercest advocates of the export trade and one of its beneficiaries. If we were to adopt an argument that the famine was a genocide, essentially an attempt to exterminate a section or all of the Irish people, it is difficult then to understand and analyse the actions and experiences of these Irish people. While they undoubtedly lack compassion and illustrated contempt for their neighbours, a contempt that had fatal consequences in many cases, this does not make the people involved in the export trade less Irish. They were as Irish as those who died in cottages, workhouses or on the roadside or those who emigrated to Britain or America. For the argument of genocide to fit, it depends on adopting a very narrow definition of Irish people which excludes these half a million farmers. Indeed, there are narratives that label them and dismiss them as gombean men, a word used to describe those who profited during the famine. However, what they were in reality is an entire section or class in Irish society who benefited in the early years perhaps of the famine, not so much in the later years. If we want to understand our history, we need frameworks which can incorporate and explain the complexities of Irish society at the time, including those who were involved in the export trade. For me, arguing the famine was a genocide does not help us understand this. While some may see this as an attempt to deflect blame from the British government, I don't see how it removes responsibility at all. Ultimately, they were the only ones with the ability and power to take decisive action and implement an embargo of certain foodstuffs. Perhaps there wasn't enough corn to feed everyone, but it certainly would have helped. Ignoring the fact that certain classes in Irish society aided, supported and indeed even lobbied for some of these policies does nothing to help us understand the past. Now to end the show, we need to ask if the word genocide doesn't adequately explain what happened in Ireland in the 1840s, then what exactly was it? Looking back at the Great Hunger, the Irish nationalist John Mitchell wrote, The Almighty indeed sent the potato blight, but the English created the famine. These lines from his book, The Last Conquest of Ireland, are quoted more than any other to support the idea that the famine was a genocide. The premise of Mitchell's argument that the famine was man-made is to a large extent correct, but this is not proof that events in Ireland in the 1840s were genocidal, and in fact it highlights a common misconception about how famines work. Since the first half of the 19th century, the vast majority of famines have been man-made in that they might start with natural occurrences like drought or in the case of Ireland, a potato blight, but these are exacerbated by devastating human interventions. They are very rarely just about a lack of food. Indeed, modern scholars tend to look at famine from the perspective of people's ability to access food that is available rather than just a chronic lack of food. Wars, for example, can be a reason in some cases why people cannot access food, but in the case of Ireland, disastrous economic policies essentially priced people out of the market and cut off their ability to access the food that was available. Tragically, Ireland is not unique. Very similar policies echo through British responses to famine in India, then under British rule. Aside from the Bihar famine in 1873, the same laissez-faire policies were implemented with horrifying results in India. This contributed to the death of an estimated 5.5 million people in the Great Bengal Famine from 1876 to 1878, and then millions more in the Great Indian Famine of the 1890s. David Nally, writing in the Atlas of the Great Irish Famine, highlighted how the Great Hunger may have been instrumental in shaping their reactions in India. While the Great Hunger was not a genocide, the fact that horrific famine appears to have been integral to the British Empire and the economic model it adopted in the later 19th century calls into question the nature of that empire and the way it's understood, particularly in England today. Repeated YouGov polls indicate nearly half the British population still view their colonial history favourably, with only one in five having a negative view of it. Frustrating as this can be, it should not change the way we understand our history. Labelling the Great Famine a genocide hinders our ability to understand our past. An unintended consequence of calling it a genocide has been that the argument increasingly detracts from discussions on other aspects of the Great Hunger. A New York Times journalist articulated this well in the 1990s during the bitter dispute between the state of New York and the British government. When talking about how the history of the famine was lost in the wider debate, they drew an analogy to the assassinated US President JFK. 
They said, People who know little about President Kennedy's political career, for instance, can lecture you for hours on the single bullet theory, a reference to a theory about his assassination. Similarly, because people have such strong opinions and beliefs around the issue of genocide, the wider history and the story of the Great Hunger is often obscured. Ultimately, I think the Great Irish Famine or the Great Hunger is an appropriate name. Famine is a truly horrific thing. It's not a natural disaster. And by labelling what happened in Ireland in the late 1840s as a famine, in no way downgrades the horrors of what our ancestors endured or minimises the role of the British government. Some of you might be surprised by my take on this issue. I would encourage you to listen to the rest of my podcast series that I've made on this so you can get a better sense of the wider history, but also research it yourself. I would encourage you to read up on the numerous books that have been published, but having spent a lot of time researching it, there's a couple of things I would say that's worth bearing in mind if you start to search for this online. I encountered countless memes based on decontextualized quotes, and these are not helpful. For example, someone could produce the words of Lord John Russell, the Prime Minister, when he said in early 1847, the pressing matter at present is to keep the people alive and use that as evidence he did all he could. The quote is true, but it would be a total distortion of the facts and his actions tell a very different story. My point is, don't just trust one quote. They need context. People like Christine Keneally, Enda Delaney and James Donnelly have written easily accessible narratives of the great hunger and their great starting points. I'm going to leave the show there. As I say, I would like to hear what you thought of it. You can find me at Irish History on Twitter or email me at info at irishhistorypodcast.ie. I would also like to thank Lynn Campbell, Tim Casey and Mark Malone for their readings in this episode. Finally, this series on the Great Famine is obviously coming near its end. While I have major plans for what comes next after it, we do have three fascinating shows which will close it out. One on how the Great Famine itself came to an end, which is by no means a straightforward story as you might expect. Another will look at the legacy of the Great Hunger and then I'm planning a pretty special show to conclude the entire series. Now some of these will take time, but I do have two bonus shows to make sure you have plenty of content. The first of these is actually on something which is one of the most requested episodes I've had since I started the podcast in 2010, and it's on something called Brehan Law. While this might not sound like the most interesting of topics, I have an intriguing interview with Dr. Gillian Kenny on Brehan Law. Gillian covers everything from divorce to Wakeford, sex magic in medieval Ireland. That episode is not to be missed, so subscribe now and get the show in about 10 days time. Then after that, I'll return with that episode on how the Great Famine came to an end. Until then, Sloan. <laughs>